Hi, I'm Dave Annell, a professional genealogist with more than 40 years experience. This talk is a brief introduction to English and Welsh administrative units and the impact that they have on our research. I want to demonstrate how the questions, where were you born and where do you live, can have a number of different but entirely correct answers and to consider the bigger question, where do you think you are? This is me standing outside my house in Mill Way. And here I am standing outside my house in Bushy. And this is me again standing outside my house in Hertfordshire. I'm now back inside my house in Mill Way in Bushy. Actually, North Bushy, but that's a different matter. But I'm aware that I'm also in Hertfordshire and that Hertfordshire is a county in the south of England. I know that England is one of the four countries that make up the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, and that the United Kingdom is geographically, if sadly no longer politically, a part of Europe, a continent located in the northern hemisphere of the planet Earth. I live at the same time in all of these places, and I could give any of them as an answer, depending of course on the context, and the answer could be correct. I guess this is quite a familiar concept, but as family historians, we need to be aware of it and of the other institutions and administrative units that had an impact on our ancestors' lives. The question of where you live or where you were born is therefore not as straightforward as it might be. And we find that our ancestors faced all sorts of challenges when they were asked to provide their address or their birthplace. We see it most frequently with birthplaces in the census where the answers can vary from precise addresses through hamlets, villages, parishes and counties, all the way to the depressingly disappointing not-knowns. But what I want to focus on in this talk is the impact that the various administrative units that governed our ancestors' lives had on the records that we use to research them. I always like to think of it in terms of hierarchies. Let's start with counties. Counties are at the heart of what we do as local and family historians. We often talk about our ancestors coming from a particular county, but I always feel that this is quite a dangerous approach as county boundaries meant little to our ancestors and we frequently find them moving from one county to another. Traditionally, there were 39 counties in England and 13 in Wales. Some of them have or had further subdivisions. Yorkshire was divided into three ridings, west, north and east. Lincolnshire into three parts, Lindsay, Holland and Kesteven. While from 1865, Sussex was divided into east and west Sussex. From a local and family history perspective, the most important records generated at a county level are probably the legal records of the Assize and quarter session courts. Moving down a level on this hierarchy, we come to the hundreds. I won't go into the derivation of the word, it's a controversial area, but we know that hundreds were established long before the Norman Conquest and that they continued to play a role right up until the late 19th century. They served many administrative purposes, but for local and family historians, the hundred is most important when it comes to records of taxation. The hearth tax and the land tax, for example, were largely administered at the hundred level. Although the term hundred was used in most of the southern part of the country, we also get the equivalent lathes in Kent, rapes in Sussex, wards in the northern counties of Cumberland, Durham, Northumberland and Westmoreland, and my personal favourite, the wapentakes of Yorkshire. The equivalent unit in Wales was the cantref. Then we come to the parish, the lowest level on this hierarchy, but in many respects, the most important in terms of our ancestors. The parish governed most aspects of their daily lives, both religious and secular, although the secular roles performed by the parish relating to matters such as the poor law, maintenance of the public highways and collection of local taxes were gradually stripped away over the course of the 19th century. 
We need to be careful when we use the term parish. We're actually dealing with three separate institutions, ancient parishes, ecclesiastical parishes and civil parishes. I don't have time to go into detail on this here, but essentially an ancient parish is one that was in existence by 1597. Strictly speaking, an ecclesiastical parish is one that was created from an existing parish after 1597, usually as a response to an increase in population in the area. But we also use the term to distinguish a parish run by the Church of England from a civil one. So in this sense, ancient parishes can also be described as ecclesiastical parishes. Civil parishes were introduced under the terms of the Poor Law Amendment Act of 1866. This was a major step on the road to transferring the secular roles of the ecclesiastical, i.e. ancient parishes, into the hands of civil bodies. Most civil parishes, initially at least, had the same physical boundaries as the equivalent ecclesiastical parish. For family historians, perhaps the most crucial role of the parish was to provide a registration service in the form of the familiar parish registers, recording baptisms, marriages and burials, a role that began in 1538 and was particularly important prior to the introduction of civil registration in 1837, when the registers formed the only legally valid record of births, marriages and deaths in England and Wales. So on this hierarchy, my house in Bushy, or at least the land on which it was built, was in the ancient parish of St James Bushy, in the Decorum Hundred and the county of Hertford. A point of order here, we can either say Hertfordshire or the county of Hertford, never the county of Hertfordshire. A good understanding of our next hierarchy is of vital importance when it comes to searching for our ancestors' wills in pre-1858 probate records, and it's all to do with the governance of the Church of England. At the top are the two great provinces, represented in probate terms by the prerogative courts of Canterbury and York. Then come the diocesan or bishops' courts, 22 of them in England and four in Wales at the start of the 19th century, and finally, the archdeaconry courts, which roughly equate to the ancient counties, but with some very significant differences. I said finally, but when it comes to probate, it's never that simple. We also have to be aware of the many peculiar courts, deaneries, manor courts, prebendary courts, and many more. The situation in Hertfordshire is notoriously complicated, with no fewer than six courts operating at the archdeaconry level, one peculiar court, and two consistory, diocesan courts. At the top level, we can at least confidently place the whole of the county in the province of Canterbury, but that still leaves us with at least ten courts where the wills of our Hertfordshire ancestors might have been proved, and the records are spread across no fewer than seven record offices from Lincoln to London. If you'd search the Hertfordshire Probate Records Index on Find My Past or the excellent volume of wills at Hertford published by the British Record Society, you've only searched the records of two of these ten probate courts. For what it's worth, the ancient parish of Bushy was in the Archdeaconry of St Albans, which was part of the Diocese of London and the province of Canterbury. In 1837, with the establishment of civil registration of births, marriages and deaths, an entirely new administrative system was required, and again we're looking at a multi-tiered hierarchy. At the top were the registration districts. These were based on the poor law districts which themselves had been created in 1834. Each registration district was divided into two or more sub-districts. Four or five was the norm. The parish of Bushy, both ecclesiastical and civil, was part of the Watford Registration District. It's important that we're aware of this as a birth, marriage or death occurring in Bushy will appear in the General Register Office indexes as Watford. When it came to taking the census, the same hierarchy of registration districts and sub-districts was used, with the addition of a lower level. Each sub-district was further divided into enumeration districts. 
Note that this was only for the purposes of taking the census. When the official reports were published, the figures were presented under a variety of administrative units, including parliamentary divisions, hundreds and liberties and petty sessional divisions, as well as separate figures for ecclesiastical and civil parishes. This has been by necessity a very brief look at the complex issue of administrative units in England and Wales. There's so much more to consider. I haven't even mentioned parliamentary wards or polling districts or municipal boroughs or manors or urban and rural sanitary districts. The list goes on. I hope this has whetted your appetite and that you'll think more about how the various administrative units that governed our ancestors' lives can have an impact on your research and that you'll go away and find out more about it. I'll just leave you with a brief list of useful sources to guide you on your journey. I hope you're enjoying all about that place. Thanks very much for watching.